Good afternoon, um, Father Lauth, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Yelm, uh, and Dr. Yelm, Miriam, and Michael, um, and all those who are organizing uh, this conference. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, Sigtuna, to this uh, beautiful uh, symposium. What hospitality. I, I think it has been really uh, impressive. Um, about 15 years ago, when I was beginning my study of icons, and particularly uh, my study of Maximus the Confessor, uh, prompted by a, a Greek iconographer who s uh, said to me that two things, it's not, it's not working, okay. Oh, this is better, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, prompted by uh, a Greek iconographer who said to me that if you want to uh, learn about icons, live in the church, and then he also gave me a passage from St. Maximus the Confessor. I started reading books on St. Maximus, and I, of course, encountered the work of Father Louth. And uh, in one particular line, uh, I read something that really opened Maximus, the aesthetic possibilities of Maximus's thought. And that was a description of his thinking as lateral. I really did not understand at first what that meant, so as often I do, since English is my second language, I went to the dictionary and then slowly I began to understand what lateral thinking is and what the aesthetic possibilities of that thinking are. Uh, since then, I have been sort of haunted by this idea of the intertwining of um, image and logos, uh, in part because I saw in Maximus, as I've seen elsewhere, um, an extension of logos into icon, into the image, the imaginal possibilities of, of speech, and then the reverse of that. Um, and so what uh, I will be um, sharing with you today is uh, part of that uh, exploration, if you wish. Um, what we have in front of us is a, an image which in, in many ways sort of continues in the spirit of what Barbara uh, was, was uh, discussing and influenced the work that I would like to uh, share with you today. Um, so this is an icon from the Castoria Byzantine Museum, the uh, 12th century passion portrait of Christ known as uh, the uh, King of Glory of Asilevstis Doxis, or, and later Akratapinus is the uh, utmost humiliation, uh, Imagopietatis in the West, and then as part of the Mass of St. Gregory, um, all the way to the New World. Another influence for the image that I will be uh, sharing uh, is this icon uh, by Lombardos from the uh, 16th, 17th century at the Byzantine and Christian Museum uh, in Athens, um, titled The Lamentation. Of course. And here is another version of the uh, King of Glory uh, here titled The Deposition, Iapocathilosis, again from Castoria. And finally, is this work that I will be discussing today. So here's my paper. There is an implication of ascent or anavasis in Eastern Christian theoria of leaving sensible things behind for the sake of intelligible things. For example, going from the bodies of beings to their logoi, to Christ the Logos, to the vision of divine light in Theoptia. Theoria in this view is a noetic exercise that has the trion God as its supra-visual final object. This object defies comprehension, but is nevertheless perceived through the supernatural saturation of one's being with the divine energies in what is, in effect, perception by participation, either methexis or kinonia, rather than juxtaposition, where the object is an antikimeno. What begins as an intellectual activity that is prompted and sustained by prayer 
may terminate in an ontological synergy with God and the vision of uncreated light. Depending on the viewer's ability, this light is to some degree perceptible, even though interior illumination is most often emphasized, as in Simeon, the new theologian. When the starting point of theory is an icon, this process is bound to affect what one sees, since right from the start, the physical and sensuous object must be left behind or below. It must become progressively invisible as image and visible only as idea or thought. In other words, since the image is transformed from a sensible to a mental object, its ontological reduction is inevitable. The picture is gradually lost in noetic translation. In the end, it may give rise to a theophany in which it will not partake. This platonizing version of Theoria found its way into the orthodox ascetic tradition through Origen and the Niptic fathers and mothers of Egypt and Palestine. It is compatible with a purging of representation in European and American art during the first half of the 20th century. An example is the adoption of geometrical and chromatic figuration in which the visible and the absent often converge. For example, in Malevich, in Kandinsky, the Cubists, and later the abstract expressionists, among others. The figurative emptiness that characterizes the pulsating chromatic fields of Rothko's paintings resonates with the contemplative's experience of interior unity and simplicity, and her ecstatic immersion in the depths, the vathos or abyss of the deity that lies beyond, a notion that we find as early as Clement of Alexandria in Stromata 5.12. How does this version of Theoria affect the icon? On the one hand, it opens up creative options regarding discarnate form and the convergence of conceptuality and art that bring the icon into the realm of modernism, postmodernism, and non Christian religious iconography, as I have shown in earlier work. But on the other hand, it deprives it of a substantive relationship to its divine subject and overlooks the existence of ambient loyi in some icons that invest them with a voice and a life of their own. According to John Chrysostom, God condescends to human vision, that's the singatavasis, by allowing only signs and fleeting glimpses of Christ's divinity that remains hidden even in the transfiguration. Since Christ, Chrysostom reasons, is the image or icon of the invisible God, his own divinity is invisible, Otherwise, he would not be an icon of the Father. O de tu aorato iconon, que aftos aoratos, epi ukani icon. Inscriptions, halos and gold, and gold leaf in iconography serve this purpose. They signify the unseen in what we see. True to this idea, John Damascene treats the icon like a simile or a metaphor, schema or typos, that reveals aspects of the deity, ekphantoriki, while alluding diktiki to its unreachable essence. Icon in Damascene is foremost a mental object or a figure of speech that, as in Dionysius' Aeropagide, quoted in Damascene's third treatise on icons, begins as a sensible, esthetos symbol or esthetic icon, and gradually rises to the immaterial images of divine contemplation, epitastias anagometha theorias. Reverse this process, as Damascene suggests, and the incarnated God becomes a legitimate subject for depiction, but always as a lower level image with a deceptive proximity to the viewer on account of its realism. Damascene is well aware that it is this proximity that makes the painted icon the object of sensuous and affective engagement associated with the idol. To avoid an impassioned relationship with icons of Christ, we must treat them as a mirroring surface on which reflections of the divine are vaguely outlined, amidros tasthias emphasis. Like a ladder, then, a hierarchy of images awaits the Christian contemplative of icons that gradually replaces the opacity of the painted picture with a perspicuous object of noetic prayer, until objects of noetic prayer, until her union with God is achieved and the ascent begins anew. This, however, is not the only modality in which an icon can be contemplated. An alternative approach draws from the pleurotic presence of Christ in all things and accords to the icon a more substantive role in the spiritual life. According to Saint Maximus the Confessor, beings exist as portions of God, mira theou, because their logoi live eternally in him, the proifestane. With the incarnation, the mystery of Christ's embodiment becomes part of the mystery of all creation. 
All beings eternally actualize the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ in their existence, aiki and pasin. Christ descends and ascends, the confessor writes, that he might fill all things. The patterns that characterize this movement of ontological methexes can find expression in art. Icons of Christ, for example, can embody the logoi that constitute his divine personhood, the antinomies and paradoxes of Byzantine hymnography uh, that Byzantine hymnography so beautifully explores, for instance, in the stasis of the Orthros of Holy Saturday or in the passion poetry of Romanos the Melodist, and in this respect express his divinity. There are paintings that animate beings with a material and formal fullness, a state of ontological exuberance, or portray them in a state of interior depletion in ontological dormancy. Images of this kind have more to offer than a mere surface form that will be lifted off the aesthetic object of contemplation. To recall a distinction made by Archman Wright Sofroni in a different context, their meanings are both emphita, imminent or silent, and enarthra, articulated or vocal. And this is from His Life is Mine. They are emphita or imminent to the extent that they subsist deep in the aesthetic object itself. They, en they are enarthra or articulated to the extent that this object represents to the viewer a recognizable signified reality or state of affairs in a natural, cultural, or symbolic order. Like persons then, these icons project their self-likeness from a deeper, not readily visible ground. So the image emerges as a Christ picture, as an epitaph picture, and so on. As the noted art historian George Kubler once wrote, artworks issue self-signals, but they also prompt the viewer to probe into their inner space and contemplate along with them. The basis of this idea is the existence in the Orthodox tradition and in its offshoots in Western religious painting of icons that I have elsewhere called exemplary or anarchic. These are not the mimetic objects that problematized medieval iconodules and iconoclasts because they have ambient energies and a dynamic physicality saturated with plastic logoi. I would like to discuss an icon that in my view belongs to this category. The icon of the epitaph, this icon of the epitaph, is the work of hieromonk Siluan Giustiniano, an American artist and iconographer of Puerto Rican descent. Um, he, it's the very first icon that he painted in 1999 uh, at the request of his spiritual father during his last semester of MFA studies at Hunter College in New York. My lack of experience in icon painting, he wrote, became an advantage since, in a way, it freed me up to approach the image without too much interpretative hesitation. This is part of a longer statement in which he talks about his choice of medium, oils on canvas, and matters relating to the composition of the icon that, as we saw, is loosely based on the 17th century lamentation by Emmanuel Lombardos and the passion portrait of Christ known as the King of Glory or Acrata Pinosis. Before painting icons, Father Siluan had worked across styles and schools from varieties of realism to abstraction and non-objective painting, uh, collage, and other postmodern forms. And he has a significant volume of work in, in, in all these uh, genres. He came to orthodoxy through an aesthetic and spiritual exploration of art's capacity to convey transcendent realities. His iconographic work today remains diverse and inquisitive with an impressive stylistic range and mastery of form. And so now begins a sort of reading of the image. And I must say that as I think about this in terms of where it began, if it matters at all, um, I think it began early on uh, when I was a child and, and I spent long hours with my grandmother at the Basilica Church of San Demetrius in Thessaloniki. Uh, being very tired for just standing up and rather bored. And, and so my attention was really taken uh, by the, uh, the frescoes and, and, and the, the murals that I saw and the icons. And I spent hours and hours, just in my mind at least, there were long hours, um, gazing at them and, and discovering like space, uh, three-dimensionality, uh, imagining all kinds of things with them. 
And um, so th this uh, way of, of spending time in front of an image, uh, in some ways being trapped in front of it, in, in a way, uh, returned with my experience in the darkroom with photography, uh, film photography, when again, you know, you stand in the presence of the image for quite some time. Um, as it comes to be, as it emerges from nothingness. Okay, so here it is. The viewer enters the icon frontally and encounters the sleeping Christ, who rather than lie flat on the plain stone slab, appears slightly elevated and turned away from the viewer, as if held by invisible hands that have yet to place him firmly on the altar or bier. If death is here intimated, its physical parameters are not fully established, since in the absence of a Joseph of Arimathea, or a mother of God, the positioning of Christ's body defies the irrevocable gravity of a corpse and immediately suggests an alternative reality. This epitaph is, th is thus open to the resurrection. The ambient reasons of the image emerge with the dualisms without the dualisms that pit senses against intellect in a fully incarnational mode with an ontological complexity that we may miss if we take icons only as semiotic tableau that are subject to various contextualities and symbolisms. Christ's halo, for example, may be the symbol of his divinity, but it is also the transparent pillow on which his head is resting. It is thus fully and dynamically incorporated in the physical and spiritual world that the icon posits, where even symbols lose their inertness and become tangible members of the divine passion. This inherent dynamism is especially visible at the icon's left side, our right, where the white linen cloth appears flat and almost transparent at the bottom, only to rise on the other side of Christ's body in the form of a three-dimensional structure that evokes the presence of a breeze or a carved shell-like enclosure, reminiscent of the linear textures or curvatures in the painting of Henri Rousseau. Like a sheltering sepulcher or a wind-filled sail, it attends to Christ's serene sleep, an object caught in a moment of ontological uncertainty, ambiguity and transformation. Rather than release its analogical modalities to reflection, the image holds them captive. Here, there is no distant, detached archetype, but the sense of an unfolding, encompassing reality. Christ's body is noticeably full and palpable, with a density and compactness that again recall the oniric figures that populate Rousseau's landscapes. The radiant red of his lips resonates with the exposed flesh of his pierced side, while his other wounds appear swollen and yet neatly painted. His body is circumscribed by very clear lines and appears at once painterly, stylized, and physically compelling, as if fusing the evidentiary force of a photograph with the free plasticity of the painted picture. A monochromatic palette that uses a range of warm burnt sienna, burnt umber, ochre, and Naples yellow as Father Siluan explains, combined with a gold background in Christ's visible isolation, contribute to the silence and solitude of the scene in which his body rests and makes itself present. This presence extends from the carefully outlined, slightly foreshortened feet and animated toes to the refined hands and fingers that share the same subtle vitality. Christ's face is serene and supple, and like the rest of his body, has the radiant warmth of life rather than the dull frigidity of death. If we bring to mind the poetic and at times tactile and visceral spirituality of Simeon, the new theologian, this is an image made to be touched and felt, where eye and hand become synergical in their scope and sensibility, and painting in a gesture of self-transcendence becomes three-dimensional and sculptural. This is especially evident in the dense physicality of Christ's feet and the rendering of his neck, shoulders, and arms, where in contrast to the articulated ribs, the round and firm musculature suggests the presence of life and movement, thus placing the viewer either in the immediate aftermath of the deposition or in the silent hours preceding the resurrection. 
The unusual placement of the body and its compact size invite the gesture of bending and lifting the reposed Christ in an embrace that recalls icons of the lamentation. For those familiar with the iconography of the Passion, this sleeping dead Christ of the King of Glory, naked and exposed for all to see, has a Eucharistic presence as the icon contemplates in its own being the intertwining mysteries of Christ's life, from the tightly wrapped infant of the Nativity to the discarded burial shroud of the Resurrection. In the midst of the silence that envelops the viewer, the image displays its imminent rhetoric. Christ's heels, ankles and knees, his loincloth and burial shroud, his soft, tenderly rendered beard and immaculate hair form the divine and human body. Each one has its logos, its plastic rationality, and when taken together, they articulate the living reality of the person they constitute. The image is thus an icon of the exemplary kind, not only because it is the tangible expression or ekphrasis of its subject's distinctive being, but also because in it, the antinomies of Christ's person are quietly reconciled and internalized in the same manner that in prayer, noetic and somatic energies fuse and inform each other. Thus the icon abides hesychastically. Although familiarity with Christian theology, aesthetics, and iconography is what enables the associations that we typically make with pierced feet and hands and the other components of this epitaphial scene, every single association offered here is found in the image itself when aesthetically probed. What we bring to the icon is thus relevant only because of what it delivers on its own in its very act of being the image that it is. The movement is reciprocal. If the image cannot sustain the concept, the concept has nowhere to go. Neither can a concept that subsists in the work be removed and separated from it since it is inextricably tied to the plastic realities that the painting puts forth. It is, in this respect, their noetic extension or projection. Contemplation, in this case, is a modality of the icon and not a noetic act in which it becomes instrumental. If we think of this type of image as the work of grace and art, then there is no need to abandon it in order to reach the divine energies, since these are at work in what stands before us, a theophany in art. The aniconic form of noesis that is required for the ascetical theoptia is part of a purgative process that prepares the person to receive the divine light, although there are cases, as in St. Joseph the Hisicast, where visual content persists. But with Christ, it is also the plerotic moments of grace in beings that bring us closer to God, although without the eschatological intensity, perhaps, of the Visio Dei. This is not to overlook the imminent eschatology of icons that takes two forms. The first stems from the reiteration of an original that is perpetuated through variants embedded in the contingencies of their time, an incarnational modality that all icons share. In other words, the same and yet distinctly different Christ appears in a Coptic icon, a Constantinopolitan mosaic, a Mistras Pantocrator, a Russian savior, or a Greek crucifixion fresco painted by some itinerant iconographer. Icons also become eschatological when they blend antiquity and contemporaneity with an ambiguity that allows them to remain temporally, topographically, and stylistically fluid and indeterminate as befits the presence in our midst of an intangible and yet intimate God. If we now add these elements to the experience of Father Silo and Justiniano's exemplary icon of the epitaph, we shall encounter, I think, the Christ of a contemporary American iconographer and the Christ of eternity inside the narrow frame of a simple image. Thank you.